Excellent. All right. Well, first, let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's I love this series. It's been one of the true highlights of the pandemic is waking up every Friday morning early because it is the West Coast uh, to attend. So um, I'm hoping I could do justice to uh, my group's uh, research. The bar is quite high from the previous uh, speakers. Um, so I'm coming to you from not from Simon Fraser University exactly, but um, nearby where I live uh, from my basement. Um, but uh, do come and visit us here on the beautiful west coast of Canada when you are allowed to travel again. Um, okay, so today I'm going to tell you about our building blocks. And so when you think about the building blocks of your body, if you were to ask a kid, they might say, oh, okay, you've got arms and legs and Maybe they start thinking about organs like maybe a kidney, a heart. And these are all really important components of our, of our bodies. Um, but if you actually started thinking more about what makes these up, you'd say, oh, ha ha, no, there's cells in each of these. And the cells are different in every body part. Um, the DNA is, of course, the same, but they, the cells look different. And that's really what defines these different tissues is, is the, the different proteins that are expressed and so on. Um, if you, however, take these uh, tissues and you decellularize them, what you find is they don't actually look all that different, okay? And so this was uh, shown during a conference I was at this summer, and I just loved it. And Carl Cadler said, yeah, we are mostly extracellular matrix. And it is the stuff, the proteins and, and other things outside our cells that really give our bodies shape and form. And so, of course, cells are important but uh, I'm gonna switch our emphasis to the things outside of cells uh, for this talk. So if you look at um, our bodies and what makes them up and particularly what makes up the extracellular matrix, one of the predominant um, proteins in it is a protein called collagen. And if you look at where in the body collagen is found, it is all over. So it's in our extracellular matrix around our cells, but it's also the primary building block of most of our connective tissues. And so uh, collagen is found in all of these tissues with different mechanical properties, material properties. Often it's found with other proteins uh, and minerals at times like in bone. Uh, other tissues like tendon are almost exclusively collagen. So our bodies are more than a quarter of the protein in our bodies is collagen. Okay, so this is a phenomenally important uh, building block and structural building block. If you look evolutionarily at where collagen arose, what you find is that um, some collagen started to really emerge along with metazoans. And so it seems like this ability to make an extracellular matrix and to make proteins that can form these matrices was really important to multicellular life. Um, later in evolution towards the vertebrates is when we started to get collagens that were able to form fibrils, which is the predominant structure we find uh, in our collagens today, although not the exclusive one as shown in the panel on the right. And also around the time that vertebrates arose is when we started, cells started to uh, have integrins that could bind to these collagens and interact with them and sense them. And so uh, collagen is, is very important for our mechanics and for our structure and for holding things together. So what is collagen, this protein? So uh, if you look at the molecular level, and you look at the individual proteins that cells make, um, what you find is that they're uh, triple helical in structure. And so um, collagen is really unique this way. And it's in fact, this triple helix that defines a collagen. And so in order to make three chains that can wrap around each other really tightly, um, it's obligatory to have a glycine, every third amino acid residue. So glycine is the smallest amino acid. In order for three chains to fit close together, um, you need to have one of them having a glycine on it. And then the three chains are staggered by one amino acid each. So with each step along this triple helix, uh, you have a glycine in one of the sort of ladder positions, if you will. 
Okay, so I have, I don't know if you can see me very well because I'm probably in a little small box on your screen, but I have my physicist's uh, rubber tube model of collagen, right? So this is the picture we're, we can think about in terms of the mechanics I'm gonna talk about today. It's three chains that wrap around each other tightly and form a right-handed super helix. Um, and uh, what we're interested in is its, its mechanical response, as I will get to. The important dimensions to remember if you want to kind of orient yourself for a sense of scale is that the contour length or the total end-to-end -end distance of this uh, along the backbone of this polymer is 300 nanometers. And so if you think about, uh, if you're more happy thinking about DNA lengths, that's about equivalent to a kilobase pair of DNA. So that's the rough dimensions of this protein. There's three contiguous polypeptide chains that then wrap around each other to make this structure. We can um, look a little bit more at what makes up the protein and what holds these chains together. There aren't a lot of super strong interactions, but what we can see is there are hydrogen bonds between the backbones of the chain. So the, the peptides are held together with bridging uh, hydrogen bonds. And there are some interactions also due to the side chains but um, the side chains protrude out into the solvent. And so um, that's another distinct thing about collagen is it doesn't have this buried hydrophobic core. So held together by mostly by uh, hydrogen bonds and some sterics. And um, so when you warm this up, what you find is that the three chains will fall apart, the denature, right? It's uh, like most proteins. And so, What's interesting about collagen is you heat it up, the three chains fall apart, you cool it back down, it doesn't reform a proper folded triple helix. There is a lot of uh, uh, residues that would need to line up perfectly in order for this to happen. And so it turns out to be a very glassy system. And people have not actually been able to unfold and refold collagen reversibly. So, uh, you, they just, they have an upper estimate for what its melting temperature is, but because it isn't reversible, we don't actually know the true thermal stability of collagen. What is known is that if you take collagen from different species, the melting temperature scales with the body temperature of the organism. And so our collagen has a melting temperature around 37 degrees Celsius, and a fish, for example, would have a collagen with a melting temperature more like six degrees Celsius. The sequences aren't very different. What's controlling that is post-translational modifications. <clears throat> so uh, the thing to remember is collagen's thermal stability is very close to body temperature, and that's unusual for a protein. Now, what was found, gosh, 18 years ago now, is that actually its thermal stability of these collagen proteins is less than body temperature. So we still don't know exactly what it is, but by doing really, really slow calorimetry studies, Sergey Lykin at NIH was able to, and his group were able to show that the melting temperature of these fibril forming collagens, the building blocks of our bodies is less than body temperature. So collagen, what are the protein in our bodies? Not thermally stable at body temperature. Huh, that's kind of weird, right? like we're not puddles on the ground. It turns out that when collagen assembles into higher order structures, that stabilizes it. And then our um, tissues will hold together just fine. Um, but it's sort of in a kinetically trapped state until it gets out of the cell and, and all the, uh, assembled into these structures. Okay, so it seems like collagen is really poised at this threshold of stability. That's, that cells can tune the melting temperature of the collagen via its post-translational modifications in order to hold it right there. And so maybe that's really important for imbuing some responsiveness to the protein and ability to modulate its local structure in response to environmental changes, mechanical force, and so on. And, and that's the, under, the overriding hypothesis that's, that's guiding my lab's research is to try to learn about this and see how uh, collagen modulates its uh, structure in response to perturbing forces of some sort. It's a hard protein to work with. You can't express it properly in bacteria. 
uh, it's it's a it's a challenge. So a lot of the sort of standard approaches from single molecule biophysics are a little bit harder here. Okay, so let's think about: Is there any examples of it being responsive to its environment um, out there already? So one is its assembly. As I mentioned, collagen uh, forms these extracellular structures. What we find is that um, the chemical environment inside the cells and outside the cells is different. Um, particularly prevalent are the chloride ions outside the cell and a change in pH during secretion to uh, export. And uh, these factors are thought and have been shown to be important for the assembly of collagens into higher order structures. So both into sort of fibro-like structures um, uh, that are the predominant uh, form of certain types of collagen and into more network-like collagens in the basement membrane. So certainly collagen is tuned to um, use environmental cues to say assemble or stay isolated as individual proteins in solution. Um, we can recapitulate this in the lab. So taking collagen from acidic pH where it's in solution to neutral pH and adding appropriate salts, it, we can spontaneously get it to self-assemble into these fibril structures. These are highly ordered where collagen stick side by side laterally um, and uh, make these beautiful long structures, can also make network-like structures. We also think collagen may be mechanically responsive. Here's a picture of a cell or the actin of a cell in uh, collagen. Collagen will be, uh, the cells, sorry, tug on, push and pull on their local uh, environment. We know the mechanics of the matrix matter. And so um, we'd like to study this more. Okay, so just uh, as a scale, here's collagen again, outside scale, cells to scale. If you're used to thinking about actin and microtubules, there they are inside. So I'm going to tell you a few very brief stories about collagen's mechanics. And um, the first is to do with uh, bending. And so how much, what's the bending energy of collagen? Is it a rigid rod or is it a flexible triple helix? And so to do this, we're characterizing it using atomic force microscopy, simply imaging the chains and then quantifying them for what's called the persistence length that reflects their flexibility. In the literature, there's a wide range of values for the persistence length of collagen, ranging from describing it as quite flexible to semi-rigid. And so we wanted to resolve this. And so the first thing we thought was, let's look at different types of collagens and see how much the flexibility varies between one and another. So their tissues are very different mechanics. So we looked at three different uh, sort of prototypical types of collagen, some of which are heterotrimeric versus homotrimeric, imaged them with atomic force microscopy. And this is the work of uh, former PhD student Nahme Rezai and undergrad Aaron Lyons. First thing you can see is they look like long thin squiggles uh, and they don't necessarily look very different from each other, but we can trace the chains, quantify their mechanics and uh, bending flexibility and what we find is there's not a significant difference among these different fibril forming collagens. So persistence length is around 90 nanometers or so. That's sort of in the middle of the reported range, suggesting it's a semi-flexible polymer. Where we do see a difference um, has come out recently with work by a uh, current PhD student, uh, Ala Alshir. Um, and that is if we take a collagen that forms these network structures, we find it's significantly more flexible. And we have uh, shown in a preprint that that's due to interruptions in this triple helix forming sequence that introduce sort of hinges there. Okay, so collagen is a semi, generally, if you have a triple helix, semi-flexible um, in terms of its bending energy. What about its response to different uh, chemical environments? So if we plate it in um, from solutions that have different uh, salt concentrations, what I hope you can see in these images is that on the left at low ionic strengths, collagen looks really quite compact. Whereas at higher salts, it tends to be much um, straighter. So if we analyze these with the same worm-like chain model we used previously, what we can find is that the persistence length seems to increase significantly with increasing ionic strength up to the levels I showed you before. 
And so this may uh, contribute to explaining this range of values that have been reported in the literature. However, when we did a close examination of this, we actually found that it's not the, the worm-like chain is not the best description. And if you look carefully, you can see that these structures on the left, while they're compact, they actually look like they're quite curved. And so what we developed was a better explanation for collagen's um, mechanics, and that is to talk about it as a curved worm-like chain. So if I show my model again, the idea is that it has some inherently curved state at low ionic strength, at least on this surface. And that as we increase the ionic strength, the, the sort of zero energy uh, conformation uh, straightens out. And then of course we have fluctuations about this because we're at some uh, finite temperature. And so the persistence length then is gonna be used to define the fluctuations away from this lowest energy state. When we do that, what we can see is that the persistence length of collagen shown here on the, on the left is not strongly sensitive to ionic strength anymore, but instead what seems to vary is the curvature. And so um, the picture at the bottom shows kind of the way we're thinking about this, uh, on, this on these mica surfaces is low ionic strength curved going to um, straighter as we increase the salt concentration. So there definitely seems to be an influence of the chemical environment in this sense. Um, we don't know if this is uh, what's going on in solution. There have been studies that have shown that the um, potassium chloride changes the melting temperature of collagen, suggesting that we're destabilizing the triple helix at low ionic strength. And there was a really nice study a number of years ago by Peter Olmsted and Raphael Mazenga suggesting that any chiral polar filament could in principle adopt a highly curved structure at an interface uh, due to the balance of energy costs to deform uh, in different ways and bind to the surface. So um, that's sort of an ongoing uh, question is, is what the role of the surface is. For now, all of our studies are using this higher ionic strength conditions where collagen seems much better behaved as a, as a standard worm chain. Okay, so I have a few more minutes, which is very good because I'd like to also tell you about what happens to collagen when you stretch it. So um, cells may do that by poking and pulling on the collagen, but also we do that. Every time we take a step, our muscles contract and they tug on tendons and tendons are essentially ropes made of collagens aligned laterally. And so what happens to this triple helical structure when we stretch it and subject it to this stretching force? So we could think about three possible outcomes, at least at fairly low forces. So I'm gonna be talking about like below 10 piconewtons of force where normally things don't change that much in structure. So one option is nothing could happen and it could simply be an entropic response to force and we just straighten it. That's like what happens at DNA in these forces. Another option is that as we stretch it, the, the triple helix becomes tighter um, and stabilizes. And then the third option is that it gradually loosens. So much as was found with persistence lengths and variability of them, similarly, you could look in the literature and find evidence for these various outcomes for collagen. Particularly, there was a couple of really nice single molecule approaches using magnetic tweezers and enzymatic cleavage where um, the Ruberti lab and the Dunn lab each used distinct enzymes targeted to collagen. So a bacterial collagenase or a matrix metalloprotease, which is a enzyme found that we have that's really important for remodeling collagen. What they found was uh, evidence that as they stretched their collagen chains in the case of bacterial collagenase, cleavage was turned off. And so Jeff Ruberti's group said, hey, that means the triple helix is tightening. Whereas with MMP, they found an acceleration of the rate of cleavage as they stretched the chain. And so they concluded um, that the chain must be destabilized uh, because it becomes easier for the cleavage to occur. So uh, not resolved. Um, so I had a, an amazing PhD student, uh, all my students are amazing, but um, Mike uh, Kirkness, and he said, well, these guys 
each of these labs use these enzymes that have evolved to interact with triple helical collagen. And so obviously their interactions with collagen are really important, but if what we are fundamentally interested in is the response of the triple helix, maybe we should use an enzyme that hasn't evolved specifically to cleave it. And so uh, Mike thought, let's use trypsin. Trypsin has been used by the collagen community for decades as a probe for how stable the triple helical structure is. It can only cut the collagen if it's locally destabilized because it needs to be able to access one of the chains. And so the idea is let's throw trypsin in with the collagen that we're stretching and let's see how much the cleavage rate changes with force. And if we are destabilizing this triple helix, then what we should see is an increase in the cleavage rate. Um, whereas in the other cases, we should see no effect because collagen can't be cleaved. So the assay then is put collagen, tether it between a surface and a bead, pull on it by pulling on that bead, add trypsin, and look at how long it takes to be cleaved. This is an irreversible measurement. Once it's cleaved, it's gone. Doing this one molecule at a time would be very painstaking. So it would be much better to look at a whole bunch of these in parallel, and then you could measure cleavage rates. So you could do this in a microscope with heavy beads, right? And you have a force from gravity from your beads pulling down, and you could just watch beads disappear from the surface as they're cut by your enzyme or as the collagen is cut by the enzyme. And then if you wanted to change the force, you could change the beads and make them bigger or more dense or whatever. But that's a lot of surface chemistry and that's a pain. So instead, what it would be nice to do is to just control the force that you apply to these beads, which you could do with magnetic tweezers as the previous two groups did, or you could use a distinct approach. And so imagine taking your sample chamber now and rotating it. Okay, so now when you're spinning this, the beads are feeling a force, uh, a very uniform force uh, that depends on how fast you spin your sample. And so you can control the force you're applying to stretch all of these molecules in your, in your field of view and beyond using this technique called centrifuge force microscopy. And this was really introduced a decade ago now by um, Ken Halverson and Wesley Wong. So to do this, you have to build a microscope that fits in a centrifuge so that you can see what's going on as the experiment is progressing. So if you can build a little microscope, put it in a bucket of a centrifuge, spin your centrifuge, then you're golden. So that's what Mike um, built, was a little centrifuge force microscope. Here is a photo of it uh, getting ready to be put in the little bucket. The whole microscope costs under $500. It stay, withstands uh, stable imaging up to about 1,000 Gs of acceleration, meaning that we can apply easily with these standard beads that we're using um, up to about 80 picanewtons of force. Nancy, you have three minutes left. Thanks, Mom. OK, so um, here's the assay then. Uh, we have our collagens in the sample chamber. We have trypsin included in this experiment. and. Uh, this whole microscope is then put, we have, this is in a microscope and you can see an image from that here. We put this whole thing into a centrifuge, start the centrifuge spinning, get up to speed, and then we uh, will have this movie start playing. There's been a little bit of cleaning up of the images, but what I want you to watch for is what happens to these beads. Okay, so we're subjecting about nine piconewtons of force to each of them. This is tenfold accelerated. And what you can see is that over time, the beads are gradually disappearing, okay? So this is suggesting that the collagen is getting cleaved by the trypsin with time. And uh, hence the beads are disappearing from our field of view. They just get whooped to the other side of the sample chamber. Okay, so let's take a look at this and compare to what happens uh, under no force. So if we just do the experiment in a microscope in the lab, we can see after 20 minutes, here's the bottom images are what uh, stills from the movie showing most of the beads have disappeared. The top shows a parallel experiment under essentially zero force um, where 20 minutes later, very few beads have been removed. So this is strong evidence of collagen destabilizing when it is stretched. We can look at the kinetics of this and count beads versus time. 
and you see a much uh, and heightened release of beads in the under force. Now, it could be that the beads are falling off the surface simply because they're getting yanked off by the force. And so we have to do a control with no trips in to make sure that we account for detachment. There is some detachment in our experiments, but if we correct for this, we can find the rate that's just due to the enzyme. And what we find from those rates is that this nine picanewtons of force enhances the rate of collagen cleavage about 20 fold. So that suggests that the collagen loosens with force. And I'll just note for high throughput experiments, this is awesome. We're getting like 10,000 individual molecular events. Okay, uh, I'm running very quickly out of time. So let me just wrap up by saying, okay, how does this compare with the previous results? Does it resolve the controversy? Well, our results agree with what was found for MMP. But if we look at the sequence of type three collagen, what we find is that actually there is a trypsin cleavage site right in the same MMP region. There are also a whole bunch of others, but it was previously shown that this site of collagen can be slightly cleaved by trypsin even at room temperature. So it is slightly unstable. So maybe we're just looking at this MMP site that's really important for remodeling, whereas the bacterial collagenase looks at other regions of the helix. So we've moved on with our AFM imaging to start looking at sequence dependent flexibility and just a little bit of a teaser here, when we look at the flexibility of little regions along the sequence, what we find is for type three collagen, there is one region here around 70 or 80 nanometers from the C-terminus that looks more flexible than everywhere else. And this corresponds to the MMP site. So what we think is that maybe there is a distinct sequence dependent mechanics of collagen that might be important for regulation. Okay, I will throw up my conclusion slides, acknowledge again the students who did the work who I mentioned throughout and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Nancy, for a great talk. So I'm going to ask you <clears throat> some questions from the chat and we will get to the rest of them during the 15 minute uh, in informal discussion. So great. the first question uh, I wanted to ask is from Meredith and she's asking, uh, what are the differences in assembly conditions for the highly ordered versus network collagen? Mm, yeah, so I didn't have much chance to uh, talk about that. They're not that different. What determines whether they form fibrils rather than networks is actually the sequence of the collagens. So the collagens that are continuously triple helical that have like this Gly XY, Gly XY, Gly XY repeating sequence with this glycine every third residue, uh, will form fibrils. So they pack very nicely. Whereas to get these networks, the, the collagens there have um, interruptions in the sequence. So you get Gly XY, Gly XY, Gly XY, something, something, blah, blah, blah. And then Gly XY picks up again. So they, they form these different structures. And we hypothesize that some of this may be due to their inherent flexibility um, driving this, as well as probably predominantly sequence interruption. Okay, and then there is a question about persistence length from Eric and a follow up question by Meredith. So Eric's question is, how close is the persistence length of a filament absorbed on a surface with AFM similar to the one in solution? Yeah, so uh, we believe that the me measurements we have at least at the high ionic strengths uh, in on the surface represent the true behavior. They're certainly equilibrated in terms of all the statistical measures we've thrown at them. There is a really wide range of persistence lengths reported in the literature. Um, the shortest values come from molecular dynamics and optical tweezers. And we've actually done some optical tweezers measurements ourselves. It's very challenging because it's a very short protein um, in terms of the lengths people usually stretch on. And I think Meredith well knows the problems that you could get into with uh, trying to estimate persistence likes from short uh, polymers. Um, so we think because there are these force-induced deformations that we're start getting hints of from our CFM studies, that the optical tweezers fitting has used too wide a force range to extract persistence lengths, um, that there's a lot of deformations happening that are softening the chains and those are responsible for the lower um, estimates. 
Um, and there's other things that I could talk about in terms of um, light scattering measurements and biases of models there, but I probably shouldn't take too long answering this question right now. Happy to discuss later. Yeah, and I guess Meredith had a, if you can answer, if you have a quick answer for this, like she had a question about surface interactions affecting the chain conformation and therefore the persistence length that you're measuring. Yes, they, they may. Uh, I mean, we don't know, for example, with the curvature, how much of that is due to a modulation in the electrostatic interaction between the collagen and the surface versus, uh, say, a change in the torsional stiffness of the collagen that allows it to adopt this curved conformation. Um, so, so we don't know. Uh, our, our sequence dependent persistence length analysis that I kind of just gave a, a quick mention of at the end, we could see that there's no correlation between the local charge on collagen and its local flexibility. So, um, but, but we don't know beyond that. And I guess the last question I would ask now is Robin's question. So Robin is asking, so we, you spoke about curvature. So, you know, can you get a super helical structure for, for the, you know, collagen because arising from curvature? Ah, that's a great question. We uh, would love to know if it's super helical in solution uh, because that could be another explanation for this. We have some evidence of curvature for the type four collagen um, and perhaps super helical structure for that based on AFM analysis. Um, but we haven't seen that explicitly for the fibroforming collagens yet. So it also doesn't form superhelical bundles uh, with multiple triple helices winding around each other? There's a very slight twist to the triple helix packing in the, in the fibril structure. So they do, there is a little bit of a, a bend and wrapping, but it's not like regular periodic. It's, it's much more subtle. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We will get to more questions in the 15 minutes at the end of both talks.